I now have the pleasure of introducing Jennifer. Jennifer is a livestock handling specialist based out of Blackie, Alberta. Jennifer obtained her undergrad degree in animal science at Colorado State University and her master's degree in veterinarian uh, preventative medicine from Iowa State University. Jennifer has over 25 years experience in the livestock industry and has worked as a consultant to the industry since 1998. Jennifer's work has taken her all over North America, across Europe, and down to Australia. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Jennifer. Thank you, Robin. We will go and get started. Um, like Robin said, this is a condensed version of the live training I've been doing um, with lamb producers across the province for on-farm euthanasia. So euthanasia itself is derived from a Greek word that means good death. How do you accomplish good death? It is when death results in a minimum of pain, fear, and distress to the animal. And this is achieved when you utilize techniques that induce an immediate loss of consciousness, followed by or in conjunction with cardiac and respiratory arrest, that ultimately re results in the loss of brain function. For people performing euthanasia, there is a certain degree of technical proficiency, knowledge, and appropriate equipment required. So I'm going to start with indications for euthanasia. So what animals actually require euthanasia? First and foremost, individuals are morally, ethically, and legally responsible for the welfare of the animals in their care. And although the financial implications are part of the decision process, an animal's welfare must never be compromised for financial reasons. So an animal's welfare always takes precedent. So what are the main indicators for euthanasia? Poor health, disease, and injury are the three most common that we are aware of. So an animal is showing signs of poor health, they become diseased or they're injured. Other indicators can actually be loss of pro productivity, so an animal is no longer viable, economics, and safety reasons. Now there's three possible treatment options for stock persons when faced with any of these situations. Your first one is to shift the animal for meat processing, but you can only do that if the animal is fit for transport and human consumption. You treat the animal where it is, or you euthanize it. A lot of people don't consider euthanasia as a treatment option, but it actually is. Just because there is a chance for recovery, it does not mean treatment is always the optimal choice for the producer or the animal. There are several questions to ask when you're trying to make the decision on whether to euthanize an animal or not. So here's a list of them. First off, is the animal experiencing a high level of pain? Will it require continual medication to alleviate pain and suffering? So is it a condition that cannot be healed to where they will always have pain? Will the animal have to endure a painful and lengthy recovery? Will the animal be likely to return to normal function post recovery? This is a common one in production livestock. So after the treatment for the condition, will they be able to still lamb? Will they be able to raise lamb? Will they still be able to gain to become a market lamb? Can the required care be provided during the convalescent period? This is a big reality today in production livestock because so many people work off a of farm. So whatever condition the animal is suffering from, will people be able to provide care? So if you're gone from your farm for 10 hours to go work, is the animal going to be okay on its own for those 10 hours? would be a good example. Is the animal likely to suffer chronic pain or immobility following recovery? Will weather extremes create inhumane conditions for the animal during recovery? So are you able to get the animals inside? Uh, this is a big thing during the winter. So are you able to take care of them in a heated environment when it's like minus 30 out? Um, a lot of times ill and injured animals are not able to thermal regulate themselves and they have a hard time staying warm. So they will need to be able to kept inside in a warm environment. Will the animal be able to or have difficulty accessing feed and water? So can they get up and walk to feed and walk to water? I have often seen animals, and I've, I've done it to myself, to where they've been able, unable to rise, 
for whatever reason, and you put feed and water in front of them. But quite often the water gets knocked over, they actually aren't able to access the bucket from the position. So this is something that really needs thought out. So being able to access it or having difficulty, you need to be able to make sure they can actually get to the water and get to the feed. Will the cost of therapy outweigh financial return? I often use this example with uh, my daughter and a 4-H U she had that had ring womb. And we had the discussion of the cost. So if we took her in, the, there was a very good chance, 90% chance the lambs were dead. We take her in, we do the C-section then you have to let her recover and get path withdrawal periods before you can ship her because we wouldn't keep her either because production was going to be an issue there with her. So do you euthanize her or do you pay to have the C-section done and go through all the recovery to ship her and not recover the, the cost that actually went into treatment? And that's a very, very valid consideration with euthanasia is will the treatment actually outweigh what you're going to get back out of them? And is the animal contagious and can spread disease? Um, so if it's a contagious disease, the animal doesn't need to be euthanized and isolated from the other animals. The big question, how long should an animal be given to recover? All of our current industry guidelines are between 24 and 48 hours. I know experience has shown me, animals will usually start to show some signs of improvement within 24 hours. And if they're not showing any improvement within 48 hours, they normally will not recover. There are exceptions to this. There are conditions that may take a little longer, but it's usually within those first 24 hours that you will begin to see recovery um, and improvement in the animals. And definitely you should see it within 48 hours. You shouldn't continue to treat animals for five or six days with, with no signs of recovery. Simply leaving an animal that is suffering to die of natural causes, or in other words, letting nature take its course is not acceptable. So you can't just allow an animal to die because you know it's going to die. So if an animal requires euthanasia, you need to euthanize it. Just don't let nature take its course. It's also not acceptable to prolong an animal's misery by delaying euthanasia for reasons of convenience. When you realize it's time to euthanize, the animal needs to be euthanized. So you can't, well, in the sheep industry, we, uh, the renderer doesn't come pick it up, but that's something I see in the cattle that, that the, the renderer or the dead stock only comes on certain days of the week. So you don't want to wait till that or, or wait till after the weekend or whatever. You need to do it in a timely manner. So what are conditions that you need to consider? Animals that are too weak, uh, to ship due to emaciation or poor body condition, if they've been unresponsive to treatment, if they have been off feed for a significant amount of time while being treated, uh, if it's a disease with no effective treatment or it's cost prohibitive, contagious or reportable disease, uh, unresolved prolapses, advanced or infectious arthritis, multiple abscesses, infected prolapse, uh, attractable diarrhea, any zoonotics, which are transmittable diseases, fractures of the legs, hip, or spine, medical conditions that result in excruciating pain that can't be relieved by treatment, a wound significantly impacting a critical biological function, so that'd be a deep wound, or profuse bleeding are conditions. This is the animal in the picture here. This is an animal, actually one of ours, that had copper toxicity. We lost seven animals to copper toxicity a few years ago. After the loss of the first one, we started euthanizing them all um, as we saw them going downhill. Copper toxicity is, a, is not a pretty depth. So as soon as we realized what we had and what we'd been exposed to, we became active in euthanasia versus just letting the animals die. Now, one thing about prey animals, when I do a lot of handling and behavior, I always work on getting people to understand the difference between prey and predator. We're a predator. Livestock are prey animals. We spend our life hunting, they spend their life being hunted, and it makes everything about us different. Now, one, of, one area is pain and suffering. So prey animals instinctively avoid expressions of pain. So this means they try to hide pain so the predators do not notice that they are vulnerable. 
So an example is a sheep may simply become less responsive or depressed and lame animals will adjust their gait or posture to mask the evidence of lameness. I always say, you like a dog is a predator, you step on a dog's paw and they like yipe and they snap at you and they strike out. A sheep breaks its leg, doesn't say a word. And it's very stoic and it does everything it can to not let you know that it is injured. So it tries to hide that and it has to do with survival instinct. Never think that just because an animal doesn't express pain in the way we do, that they're not experiencing pain and that they're not suffering because they are. Experience and education of animal handling is important. Um, and you might, you need to be able to assess animal behavior. And it's having an eye for animals. You need to know that when they have those subtle signs of pain, you are able to pick up on them. So other indicators, loss of productivity, um, like I already talked about, when the cost of the treatment exceeds the productivity income. So that's why you should always make sure you cull animals in a timely manner while the animal still fit for transport and processing. And that way you can recover some of the animal's values. If you wait too long until the animal's too old or um, you may not be able to ship it. Economics. So what are the economic factors we consider in, around euthanasia? The cost of treating animal, the loss in productivity during the illness and injury, impact on potential affection to other animals. So if it's something that contagious, you don't want to expose other animals to it. And the cost to return the animal to profitable productivity. Then there's the health emergency. Now this is the responsibility of CFIA under the Health of Animals Act. So if we have an outbreak of an animal disease or reportable disease, um, CFIA or the provincial vet will take over. So they may, things that may happen is animal movement control, they may do mass euthanasia, disposal, um, cleaning and disinfectant of infected premises are all part of that too. So now we're going to touch on the euthanasia process. So proper preparation for euthanasia will help ensure that the process is as effective, safe, and stress-free as possible for both the handler and the animals. So how do you properly prepare for euthanasia? Well, you do it actually before you begin euthanizing an animal or before you actually have one that needs euthanasia. Training is a big part of it. So understanding how the method works. For so long, the only training material that any of the livestock species groups had was a cartoon drawing with an X on the head. We really didn't train producers in all aspects of euthanasia. We just gave them a got diagram and told them, hey, if you're going to shoot an animal, this is where you should shoot and that's all they had. You wanna make sure you have the appropriate equipment, so whether that be a captive bolt gun, firearms, but you wanna make sure you have the equipment to perform it. If you need to restrain an animal, you'll need proper restraint. You will need to be aware of low stress handling of the animal during euthanasia. This is a time when they're under great stress and very well may be immobile, so you need to understand that and implementing safety procedures for both people and animals in the immediate area. So we wanna keep everybody safe during euthanasia. Animals should be handled as little as possible and appropriately restrained. Unfit animals should not be moved for euthanasia in cases, except for in cases of human safety. So you don't wanna move an animal. So if you have a non-ambulatory animal or an animal cannot rise and walk on its own, an animal with a broken leg that it is going to cause them pain and it will to walk. You do not want to move them. The only time I approve of movement of animals for euthanasia is when it's a case of human safety or the safety of the other animals, which is very rare. We can usually move the other animals out and clear people out of the way. So do not move animals. Don't remove them out for a matter of convenience. If an animal must be moved though, you must use a humane method such as a sled. So you can actually just grab the animal and drag it out. So there, um, you can use sleds, this is on farm. You actually cannot move non-ambulatory animals and slaughter plants at all. They do not allow that, it's against the law. But if you have to move it on a farm to get it somewhere safer out of the way, uh, do so as humanely as possible. Sheep are easier to get in a sled and move if you need to do that. Now, if you need restraint, um, 
which we don't always for the animals, such as if they're non-ambulatory and, and not moving, you can actually shoot them or euthanize them where they are. But if you do need to restrain one, you need it to be appropriate for the animal. You wanna minimize the stress and pain during euthanasia. So you don't wanna strain them in a way that, restrain them in a way that's gonna cause distress or pain. It needs to be appropriate for the method of euthanasia chosen. So if you're using a captive bolt gun or a firearm, you need to restrain them so you have safe access to their head to apply the gunshot or the captive bolt gun. You should restrain them for the shortest time possible. It needs to be safe for the handlers. And you need to make sure you can get the animal out of the restraint after they've been euthanized. So don't shoot them in an area where you can't get them out afterwards. So possible uh, proper restraint depends on the size and condition of the animal. So you can restrain them by hand if they're lambs. You can use chutes or you can use halters. So you can actually, uh, if they are mobile, you can tie them up to apply the captive bolt gun or you can put them in a chute or a scale. Scales are hard to get them out of and the smaller chutes, um, just so you know, when they go down, if you shoot them, lambs will kick, which I'm gonna talk about. So the animals will do kicking and it can be very hard on your scale or equipment like that. So that needs to be a consideration also. So how do you decide what method you're going to use? So there's 12 main considerations when selecting a euthanasia tool. And we have limited tools um, available to us for sheep. So the 12 main considerations we look at, and this is when I was on the, the committee for development of the updating of the America Vet Medical Association's euthanasia guidelines. We did the physical methods and these are the 12 things we had to look at. We had to look at safety. So how safe is it? Uh, some devices are safer than others. So a captive bolt gun would be considered safer than a firearm just because there's not a free bullet. Animal welfare. So is it good on the welfare? Does it effectively euthanize the animal without putting its welfare in jeopardy? Is it robust and reliable? This means is it consistent and successful application of euthanasia? And is it repeatable? So if I'm able to use it, can other people repeat the same success with it that I can? So you want it to be repeatable and you want it to be robust and reliable. So it's effective 100% of the time. So at, try, that's what you aim for. So we do have some, um, within the slaughter industry, it's 99% effective is what you aim for on every shot for a single application. What is the cost of it? So the initial cost um, of a captive bolt gun is high, but spread out over the years, and if you maintain it, the cost to operate it is not high, would be an example there. What is the skill level required? required? A firearm requires a higher level of skill than a captive bolt gun does but they both do re require a certain set of uh, skill level. Aesthetics, so what does it look like? Um, so that would be, how does the animal re react? So the amount of cook kicking, um, the amount of blood loss would be a consideration there also. Aesthetics is a big problem with blunt force trauma, which we're going to talk about. The aesthetics of blunt force trauma are terrible. So. Operator comfort, comfort, how comfortable are people with it? Some people would be more comfortable with a firearm than they would with blunt force trauma or more so with a captive bolt gun than with a, a firearm with a free bullet. So how comfortable is the operator with the, with the method? Are there any legal restrictions? So you do, there are, you do need your firearms, your PAL here in Canada in order to have a firearm, but you don't need one for a captive bolt gun. Biosecurity comes into play. So if you don't want any blood loss, you would wanna choose a method that doesn't do that. Age of the animal and the animal type. So euthanasia, which I'll talk about blunt force trauma is allowed on very small and young animals, but it's not on mature animals. And what is your disposal methods, which I'll discuss a little at the end, but barbiturate overdose, which is if you have a veterinarian come out and do barbiturate overdose, your disposal methods become quite limited because you cannot scavenge them, you cannot compost them and you cannot send them to the renderer because of the drugs used. So those are the things we look at. 
So application of it. So there's actually three different modes by which death will occur. Direct depression of the system, hypoxia, as an example, that would be the use of gas and CO2, and physical disruption of the brain. So that would be through gunshot or captive bolt gun. Now death itself is a process and doesn't occur immediately. Um, it can actually take, I know when I did my research, I did uh, my thesis for my master's degree on the euthanasia of pigs uh, using captive bolt gun technology. And some of the animals to reach death actually took upwards of 10 minutes. The animals never regained consciousness, but it took them almost 10 minutes for their heart to stop and the death process to be complete. So what you, what you want, your goal is to have them be rendered insensible and to go on to die without them regaining consciousness or experiencing any pain. So first they will have a rapid loss of consciousness. So you knock them unconscious. That is followed by cardiac or respiratory arrest, a subsequent loss of brain function, and that eventually results in death. So the last thing to occur is the cessation of heartbeat. So if your, your choice of firearms, this euthanizes through the mass destruction of the brain, and the degree of brain damage is dependent on the characteristics of the firearm, the nature of the bullet, and the accuracy of the shot. For this reason, it is imperative to use a sufficient, sufficiently powerful firearm. And this is one of the biggest challenges we have with firearms is actually people not using one that is powerful enough. So the guidelines for euthanasia by gunshot is first it must be performed by a trained, skilled, and licensed handler using a registered firearm. The shooter should wear both protective ear and eye gear. All firearms must be maintained and kept clean and ammunition kept dry. This is critical to the effectiveness of the firearm. If you have damp ammunition or a gun that is very dirty and hasn't been maintained, the firearm very well may not be effective. You should always ensure you have a clear background when shooting. And if you possible have a backstop, such as a manure pile, that'll stop the bullet if it passes through the animal. So this is the challenge. I know I just stated that we have challenges with people not using powerful enough, but especially with sheep, if you use a firearm that is too powerful, the chance of pass through is, is quite great with them. And a firearm should never be held flush in an animal's head. This may cause the gun to explode. So you have to be backed off of the animal. Safety of the handlers, public and other animals is critical. Other people and animals must be behind the shooter and out of the line of fire. Ricochet can occur off a skull, especially off of your big rams and animals with heavy skull mass or horns, off of pavement or other solid objects due to missed shots. For purposes, uh, euthanasia purposes in Canada, uh, you can use handguns um, if you're licensed to do so, but you should be shooting uh, less than two to 10 inches with those. Shotguns are very effective. I actually have a shotgun, it's what I prefer, uh, but they are for a closer range shot. Uh, 2016 or 12 gauge can be used on all weight class and species classes. You can use number four, five, or six bird shot, but that is only appropriate for very close range because bird shot spreads. I actually prefer slugs um, is what I use in my, uh, my shotgun because it won't disperse when it leaves the barrel where bird shot spreads as it comes out of the barrel. The most common rifle found on farms are those of 22 caliber. Uh, and a lot of our guidelines, especially our older guidelines say a 22 caliber is sufficient but a lot of people don't realize how many different cal uh, cal 22 caliber firearms there are with a varying degree of muzzle energy. So a lot of them do not recommend the, uh, meet the recommended minimum of 300 foot pounds of muzzle energy. So muzzle energy is how hard and how fast a bullet or a slug travels out of a gun. So depending on the firearm, like my son's gopher gun, he has his little 22 long rifle that he goes out with, only has between 100 and 100 foot, 115 foot pounds of muzzle energy. So you need to know what your muzzle energy is with your firearms. And you should 
have a minimum of 300 foot pounds of muzzle energy provided. A 22 Magnum, on the other hand, uh, in comparison to my, my son's gopher gun, can provide up to 2,200 foot pounds of muzzle energy. So you can see there's a significant difference. So this is the location of, of um, placement of a, a free bullet when you're shooting a sheep. Um, the top of the head is the ideal, they say, but it's one of the hardest places to shoot with a firearm because you have to hold the firearm at such a, uh, a strange angle that's straight up and down. And for anybody who knows me, I'm not very tall, so I could never do that <laughs> just because of my height. So you can either do the pole shot from the back or you can do the frontal shot. The sheep's brain is located actually very close to the top of their head. So any of that area on top of the skull would be effective in the euthanasia of sheep. If you have a, a heavily horned animal that has a, a, a major skull mass or horn mass coming in from the back, which is the pull shot is the best shot to make because it's where the skull is actually thinnest. Accuracy of the shot is vital. So you need to make sure you're um, shooting in the right place and the animal's head should be stationary. So one of the missed shots often are because an animal moves its head. So you need to make sure that the animal is still when you do it. One shot should be enough. However, a second shot or a secondary action, which I'll talk about in a little bit, such as pithing or exanguation may be necessary. But normally one shot, if you ap appropriately applied it, with a uh, powerful enough gun, one shot would do the job. There's nothing wrong with uh, delivering a second shot for security though. So this is a captive bolt gun. So captive bolt guns are a penetrating captive bolt gun consists of a steel bolt with a flange and a piston at one end, which is housed in the barrel. So when you fire it, um, the expansion of gases propel the piston forward and forces, forces the bolt out of the muzzle of the barrel the, uh, the bolt goes into the head of the animal and then it is retracted back into the gun. So it's like a firearm, but it's without a free bullet. The ones we use for on-farm euthanasia are, are most commonly um, powered by gunpowder in a cartridge, and there's also compressed air. So some of our non-penetrating guns, which I will talk about in a little bit, are pneumatic or they're powered by compressed air. And the slaughters, the uh, captive bolt guns that they use at slaughter plants are actually normally pneumatic, and those are air powered, so they can be either or. So, what are the two main factors that affect the um, affect the effectiveness of the captive bolt gun? It's the bolt velocity and accurate placement. So, your your firearm, the same as firearms, it needs to be powerful enough and has to be accurately placed. So the bolt must have sufficient bolt velocity for the weight class and animal type it's being used on. And the, the gun you saw previously, this one right here, if you look in the cases, the different colored cartridges actually are the different power loads that you use with the different heads. So on this example here, we have four heads. We have a non-penetrating, we have a short bolt, a standard bolt, an extended bolt. So the non-penetrating would be used on lambs and the extended bolt would be on your mature animals and your larger, your larger rams with thicker skull mass. And the color you choose of your cartridge determines the power uh, that is delivered from the cartridge when you shoot it. So you need to match those two things. Uh, bolt velocity is dependent on the grain strength or the PSI. So if it is a pneumatic one, it would be based on the air pressure. Maintenance of it storage and repair. Maintenance is huge with these guns to keep them effective and you want to make sure they're properly stored. And the gun must be accurately placed on the animal's head. Now this is different than the captive, uh, than the firearm as a captive bolt gun has to be held flush to the animal's skull for it to be effective. It cannot be held back. It has to be held firmly to the animal's head. Now the most common, uh, Types of captive bolt guns penetrating are going to be your 9 millimeter, your 22, or your 25 caliber. And they come in two styles. The one I showed you in the previous photos was the pistol grips. It actually uh, resembles a, a, a pistol. Or this one in this picture here, where you're training with on, on pig heads, is a cylinder or an inline. So it's a straight gun. 
So there's two different styles of guns. I prefer the pistol grip because everybody knows what end is out, or I hope so, on a pistol grip, where the end lines we tend to have more injuries with because quite often people who aren't familiar with them or first time users will actually hold them upside down or backwards with the bolt pointed at the shooter. So uh, the pneumatic penetrating guns um, are normally found in slaughter plants. So you won't find those out here for the penetrating. We will find pneumatics or uh, air powered ones um, for the non-penetrating guns, but not for the penetrating. So here's an example here. This is from Ackles and Shovel. So they produce the cash gun and it shows you how they color coordinate. So it tells you what bolt you should use and what color of cartridge you should use for each of the different animals. So as you can see, there's neonate lambs, lambs, sheep, and then mature sheep and rams and mature, uh, mature sheep and rams with extensive horn structures. So it tells you what size cartridge you should use and what bolt head you should be using. So with the cartridges, they're measured in grains. So the higher the amount of grains, the larger the animals they're intended for. So the orange has the higher amount of grains than the blue, yellow, or pink do. It's highly recommend that you actually utilize captive bolt guns used for on-farm euthanasia. So both Jarvis and Cash have these um, firearms available now in the dispatch kit and they are designed for euthanasia. It's also what I did my research on to confirm them as single step euthanasia. Uh, some guns for years, captive bolt guns were recognized as stunning devices only, but now ones designed for on-farm euthanasia are effective one-step methods. So when using them, only trained handlers should use these. They should understand the gun's features and how to properly apply them. You should wear protective um, ear and eye gear with them. Uh, never cock the gun until you're ready to fire. You should always have the safety set until you're ready to discharge it. And almost all our guns now do have uh, safeties on them. But there are some guns on the market right now that do not have a safety and I don't, I actually don't prefer the use of them. So when purchasing a captive bolt gun, please look into whether there is a safety setting on them or not. The discharge end of the captive bolt must always be pointed towards the ground. So if you ever have a misfire, so you fire, you pull the trigger and it doesn't um, shoot, uh, do not open the gun for 30 seconds because this might be a hang fire and it actually just might delay it. So just uh, wait 30 seconds then open the gun up and put a new cartridge in. And animals may need to be restrained as the animal's head must be stationary before shooting. So this makes it a little different than uh, free bullet is because you have to get right up to the animal in their head. But it is effective when you're able to do this. Your location is going to be the same as the gunshot. I will tell you with the captive bolt gun, it is easier to make the shot on the top of the head just because of the size of the gun and that you have to hold it flush to it so it doesn't have the long barrel. So as I've said a couple times now, uh, make sure it's held firmly against the animal's head. If it's not, it may um, not penetrate and it also will not have uh, the concussion effect that it should. So concussion is a big part of the effectiveness. So it's not just the bolt penetrating the brain, it's the concussion when the bolt makes the initial impact with the skull that also leads to effective death. Um, you can approach the animal from head on or from behind um, or you can come from off the side of the animal with the gun but you just need to make sure that you are able to place it flush to their head and the recoil there really isn't a lot of recoil with them but it is dependent on the gun the caliber how many buffers are within it the cartridge size and the size of the animal and one shot should be enough also um, but you can place a second shot such as pithing or exanguation may be necessary. Most of the time it's not. I personally I always do two shots. I do one shot, then I reload and I put a second shot in. It's just a safety thing to me. And if you do, re, um, if you do put a second shot in, it shouldn't be administered in the same place. If the, sa if the first shot was placed in the correct position, always go a little above and to the side for the second shot. And if the first shot was incorrectly placed, you should place it in the correct spot. Captive bolt guns can, must be cleaned and maintained in order to operate effectively. Uh, this is one thing I tell people and get on them all the time for. I audit to this also. 
So you should always clean them after you've used them on the day of use and you should regularly pull them out and just do a quick clean and maintenance of them or oiling oil of them, especially in Alberta where it's so dry. And your um, caps, your cartridges, your bullets should be stored um, in a humidity free environment. Manual blunt, form, trauma, blunt force trauma, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. So this is when you do a blow to the head by hand. So you take an object such as a ball peen hammer and you strike an animal in the head. This is only acceptable for lambs under five days old or uh, less than 20 pounds. And this is where I talked about the aesthetics are terrible on this. So if anybody ever sees you do it, it shows up on video or whatever, the aesthetics are very bad um, with the animals. So, and uh, they can be challenging. A lot of people aren't comfortable with this. Actually research showed that the majority of people when they do manual blunt force trauma, they close their eyes and hesitate right before making impact with the animal. If you do choose to do it, the object should be brought to the animal's head, not the animal to the object. Striking the animal to the object significantly decreases the animal welfare stand, uh, standards, so you do not want to swing them. So what are acceptable tools right now? Ball peen hammers, steel rods, wooden clubs, and uh, pipes. So we do have the non-penetrating um, fire gun. So uh, there is the one I showed you in the euthanasia kit, which is what I actually use on my lambs. It's got a non-penetrating head. You fire it exactly the same. You use one of the light charges and it comes out and it knocks the animal in the head and it kills them through the concussion, but it does not break their skull. So um, the aesthetics of it are much better. Uh, and it's much more reliable, way more reliable than manual blunt force trauma. There's a new gun on the market, which I actually am going to start testing right away here on lambs and piglets and rabbits. And it's air powered. It's a little portable one that you hook a little cartridge up to and it fires off um, the shots, uh, the non-penetrating shot in the same way. So we definitely have tools on the market now that are very effective for lambs to allow for blunt force trauma with a controlled device though. Secondary methods, I'm just going to quickly go through this, these. If you use a firearm or a captive bolt gun, you can do something called pithing to ensure death. And this is when you take a steel rod. I make mine from high tensile wire, but it's just inserted into the bullet hole, the hole you made in their brain, um, and it goes into their brain and it just confirms death. So um, you just move the rod back and forth and it'll, it'll ensure death for you. And then there's exanguation, which is bleeding an animal out afterwards, which most people do not want to do. It is recognized as a secondary method, but it's messy and there's biosecurity issues and health issues with it. Moving on to death. Like I said earlier, death is not immediate, but a process that can take in excess of 10 minutes to be complete. So first the animal is rendered insensible, then the body begins to die as the brain stops, the lungs stop breathing, the heart quits beating, and the blood quits circulating. So that's the process. Now upon loss, loss of consciousness, reflex motor activity or muscle spasms are likely to occur. So they kick. Um, lambs do this, uh, sheep do this, sheep and pigs and poultry are three of the most reactive to this. They can have very violent kicking um, after they've a captive bolt gun and, the, and uh, blunt force and firearm. So they will uh, kick quite a bit. This is actually a sign of death. Many people believe that that is a sign that the animal's in pain or distress. It's actually a good thing to see. If I don't see any kicking, I get a little concerned and I have a, a second look at the animal to make sure it was effective. Um, because you do want to see some kicking, but this is a very natural reaction. It's involuntary, uh, and it's very common, like I said, with the three methods I've talked about today. The violent kicking shouldn't last longer than the 15 or 20 seconds, so, and then it should slow down some. I know in pigs, I did the research um, in, in the hog industry is where I did my research, but we found we had a range from zero kicking, and this was, the, I see this usually in animals that are near death when we um, euthanize them, but we had, we counted kicking just on one leg and we had animals kick over 300 times with one leg that were effectively stunned and killed. So they never came back, but that's how many kicks we saw on them. So you want to make sure you determine death before an animal is moved or you leave the area. Confirmation of the onset of death, 
process, which would be insensibility or unconsciousness, should occur within 30 seconds after first euthanasia application. So you need to determine right away that you actually rendered them insensible and then that they will go on to die. So your primary indicators here are lack of corneal reflex. So you tap them, don't poke them in the eye. I'll see people poke them in the eye. I always tap their eye right next to the side of it because if they're conscious and they're feeling pain and they're awake, it really hurts if you poke them in the eye. So you don't want to do that. So just tap beside their eye. Lack of rhythmic breathing. So you don't want them moving, breathing in a normal way. And loss of deliberate movement, which means they should not right themselves. They should not stand up and they should not lift their head off the ground. Um, the other thing that you look for is blinking. <clears throat> not just, usually you'll have blinking if you'll have corneal reflex. So this is when an animal expresses natural blinking. So it blinks like it would standing out in the field. If I see one blink, I will watch. I usually want to see two or three before I determine uh, whether the animal actually is, is conscious. But sometimes I'll see one blink, their eyes open, and then you'll watch their pupils dilate. So at least three of signs of death must be confirmed uh, to verify an animal is dead. And it is false to assume an animal is dead because it's not moving. So the absence of rhythmic breathing, so you don't want any natural breathing. They can exhaust air when they're kicking. You'll see that sometimes that's not natural breathing. So it's the in and out movement. Lack of palpebral or corneal reflex. So palpebral is actually, it's a big word, but it means you rub the eyelashes. So either rub the eyelashes or touch through the corneal reflex. Dilation of pupils, you'll watch their pupils dilate. And then absence of rhythmic heartbeat. So uh, like I said, the heartbeat may continue for a very long time, as long as they are showing no other signs of sensibility, no blinking, no writing reflex, and um, no breathing, their heart will take a while. And sometimes it stops and restarts. So and to check their heartbeat, just go uh, underneath their front leg. And that's usually where you'll feel it, like in their armpit area, right up in there. So, so how do you know if an animal is still alive? It attempts to write itself. It vocalizes after application. It has controlled eye movement or natural blinking. Extended period of aggressive movement. Um, you do want some kicking, but if it goes on and on and on and on, you need to look at why. Uh, a lot of times the sex shot will stop that too. Constricted pupils, which means their pupils have not dilated yet. And response to painful stimuli. So even just give their nose a little punch, a pinch and see if they respond to that. And finally, we're going to wrap up with disposal. So what do you do after you've euthanized them? Sheep are kind of limited uh, because renderers do not usually pick them up. So following euthanasia, it's your responsibility to dispose of the carcass in a timely manner. And what are the factors that impact disposal methods? One is your method of euthanasia, biosecurity, and health, and health of condition of animals prior to death. So like I said, the method of euthanasia would be barbiturate overdose. You cannot scavenge them. Um, you cannot bury them because an animal, another animal, wild animal might dig them up. You cannot compost them either. So uh, free bullets and captive bolt guns are the two methods that actually give you access to all methods of disposal that are available to you. They aren't restricted. So in Alberta, uh, disposal off Options include scavenging, burial. So scavenging, I'm sorry, scavenging is when you go put it out on the back 40. So if you go leave it um, out in a field for the coyotes and birds and whatever to come eat, that is scavenging and it is legal to do that in Alberta. There's burial, on-farm composting, and composting is actually becoming quite popular. Rendering, this is when the renderer comes and picks it up. So Alberta processors. So we have Alberta processors, Northern Alberta processors, and Southern Alberta processors. Um, but they usually do not come get sheep. There is a renderer in Ontario that, that does, but I know Alberta processors does not accept sheep for rendering. If you have other stock, they will take cattle, um, but they will not take sheep. Incineration and then going to a landfill. So check with your local landfill and see if they do accept dead stock. So several of them do. Now there is limitations on this. So if you go to Alberta Agriculture, they actually have Alberta Agriculture and Forestry now. They actually have three incredible books they put out on disposal options. They have one on composting, they have one on all disposal methods, and they have one on burial and go look those up. They're great, great books with a ton of information in them. 
but just as a 30,000 foot view, you cannot dispose of more than 2,500 kilograms in one spot, which is a lot of sheep, but still. Um, so you have limitations there. If you're gonna bury them, they have to be so far away from a road, so far away from a, a water source, uh, so far away from your neighbors. So there's a lot of rules around this, um, but go find those documents. Um, they're great, great documents with a lot of good information in them. And as part of the codes of practice, you need to develop a euthanasia plan. So producers are supposed to have a euthanasia plan. And I've worked on putting one together that you just have to fill in the blanks um, with Alberta lamb. So you, it needs your farm on it and what your manager is. You need to list on it if you have employees or family member who's actually been trained in euthanasia and when that training was. Put a list of what conditions would require euthanasia. So as you can see, we have a, a list on there, enabled eat or drink, untreatable conditions are examples. What are your acceptable methods? So what method would you use for lambs, ewes and rams? If you need to use restraint, what type of restraint? So like lambs could be by hand. Death must be confirmed before animals are moved or disposed of, so you're making that statement. What is an acceptable secondary method? So do you use pithing? Do you use a second shot because the second shot is an acceptable secondary method? Or do you use um, exanguation? Put down a conduct if you are suspicious of a disease your animals may have. And who is your veterinarian and dead stock removal? Um, for land producers, though, find out if you have somebody who actually accepts them. So some renders do and some don't. But like I said, Alberta processors out of Calgary do not, and I'm assuming the other three wouldn't either, but uh, the other two wouldn't either, but give them a call. And this, I'm pretty sure Robin can correct me on this, but I'm pretty sure this is actually sitting in the manual that you were provided as part of this course. So this template is in there. And within our codes of practice, this is the requirements for euthanasia. So I'm not going to read these all to you. Basically what I have covered in uh, the training meets the requirements and covers off the requirements of the codes of practice. So these are listed in the manual, manual also for what you need to meet. And with that, I am done. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer, uh, for that great presentation. So we do have um, about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I don't see any questions in my question box yet, so we'll give attendees on the line a few minutes here to type in their questions. Just a reminder that your, um, your question panel, it's on that, uh, that con control panel you have with GoToWebinar. It's one of the drop downs, and you can just type in your question there. So I'll give it about a minute here, Jennifer, and uh, we'll see what comes in. Okay. 